We live in a time of great cities where half the world's population is caged in an urban zoo. Conditions here are unkind to simple, loving family relationships. The great city may be full of novel excitements, but it's a harsh environment for all those who fail to make it to the top. All too often there's stress and frustration. How does this pent-up emotion find an outlet? Last year in the United States, there were over a million cases of wife battering reported to the police. And heaven knows how many more that weren't reported. Some authorities put the figure as high as four million. And 4,000 cases annually see the battering so severe that it leads to the death of the female partner. This is a hideous problem of modern urban living because it is essentially a phenomenon of the big cities. Well, there's people up in the house. You know, I'll just knock there and see if everything's OK. Hi there. Yeah, 30, I got the right house. You best get uh, cover down here. The fire department's on the way. That's good. That's right. He woke up, he came in here, and he called when he saw you beat up. No, he was beating me up, and I told my brother to call. And my brother went back. I'm through playing games with you. Who am I? Hey, I'm not. You never let go of me. Lisa, would you please come and talk to me? Lisa, would you please come talk to me? Okay. Let us work this out together, man. You guys are getting involved in something you shouldn't be. Would you let me work this out? Lisa, come here. Lisa, come here. Please. Okay. Please. I'm come here, Lisa. No, can I talk? As city police forces throughout the world know all too well, severely stressed men frequently redirect their aggression onto their wives. The wife, the person who should be the most loved, becomes the most abused. You're going to sit in my car, then we'll talk about you talking to your wife. Do you understand that? With over half the human population now living in big cities, this is not a problem that's going to go away. But it wasn't always like this. Because marital discord is so common today, we've painted a picture of our primitive ancestors as sexual brutes, the caveman dragging his screaming wife off to his den by her long hair. The truth, I suspect, was rather different. We can get a glimpse of what life in a small primeval tribe was really like by watching one of today's surviving tribal societies the Baka Pygmies of West Africa. Here, it soon becomes clear that the men and women form lasting pair bonds and enjoy a remarkably harmonious social existence. A key feature is that the men are often away hunting while the women remain at the very center of society. The men rely on the women for building the little huts, for gathering vegetable food, and for preparing the meals. The women rely on the men for animal food and for protection against outside dangers. It's a well-balanced system in which the sexes depend heavily upon one another. So our primeval days must have been remarkably peaceful. We'd added highly nutritious meat to our diet, had developed language, and had rapidly become the most successful species on the planet. We simply couldn't have done all of that if there'd been constant squabbling and fighting within the tribe. But when this ancient type of hunter-gatherer society switched to farming about 10,000 years ago, things started to change. When primitive farming first began, the breeding of animals and plants became the way of life. The earth gave up its bounty, and the early farmers began to see the earth as a great mother, providing them with their nourishment, giving birth to their foodstuffs. Now, the next step was to turn Mother Earth into an Earth Mother, a symbolic female, a gigantic female, a great goddess, one whose fat-laden body symbolized the fat of the land. Here at uh, Tashen Temple, an ancient prehistoric temple in the middle of the small island of Malta in the Mediterranean, we're lucky because there survives half, at least, of the biggest of all those early Mother Goddess figures. When it was uh, complete, it must have been 
10 or 12 feet tall. But unfortunately, the top half of it has been vandalized, perhaps by someone who didn't quite appreciate the idea of such a dominant female running society in those days 5,000 years ago. But the lower half is still with us to make it quite clear to us just how powerful was that great goddess. Luckily, smaller versions of her are still found from time to time, dug up from the ancient soil and carefully preserved in museums all around the Mediterranean region. The mother goddess had two major roles to play. She symbolized the fertility of the crops and the domestic animals, and she also symbolized the fertility of the human female. In those early days, the whole population of the world was extremely limited, and breeding large families was vitally important. Women would pray to the Great Mother to make them fertile, to provide more children to work the land. The Mother Goddess, the all-controlling maternal deity, dominated human society for thousands of years. She was seen as the source of all life and the nourisher of every living being. Her great body gave birth to everything that breathed and moved on the face of the earth. Males were mere accessories, almost disposable, while she was the essential figure around which everything revolved. This is the site of one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Temple of Diana at Ephesus in western Turkey. Diana was one of the last of the great fertility goddesses and flourished here in the first millennium BC. Her temple was the largest ever built, three and a half times bigger than the mighty Parthenon in Athens. Sadly, little of it has survived. But all is not lost. A few statues of her still remain, like this one in the nearby museum. Because Diana was a great goddess, she couldn't lie with a man. She had to remain an eternal virgin. But as the great Earth Mother, she also had to give birth to the whole of nature. So. How could she give birth and remain a virgin? This was a difficult problem. It was solved in a rather strange way. Each spring, a wooden effigy of the goddess was placed in a position nearby a ritual sacrifice. And at this sacrifice, bulls were castrated and their testicles were hung in rows around her body. This is a Roman version in marble and it shows the testicles carved here on the front of her body. There are 30 of them. In those days, when this ritual took place, it was believed that by some magical process, the sperm inside the bull's testicles would diffuse into the goddess's body and there would make her pregnant. She would then be able to give birth to the whole of nature. Now this quality of being a virgin who gives birth, was an attribute that was later adopted for another figure, one who, rather coincidentally, came to live nearby here, namely the Virgin Mary. She lived in a house only eight or nine kilometers from here after the crucifixion in the latter part of her life. And it's interesting that she too, later on, became revered once more, almost like a goddess. In many places, it's not Jesus who is the center of local worship, but his mother, the Holy Virgin. This is permitted by the church because of her relationship with the official Son of God. But in reality, possibly unconsciously, the faithful who painfully walk to the church on their knees have returned, if only slightly, to the age-old mother goddess worship. The Christian Virgin has once again taken on the mantle of the Great Mother.
In the male-dominated Catholic countries, this worship of the Virgin Mary is a subtle form of religious rebellion that the priesthood finds hard to oppose. According to church doctrine, only Jesus is to be worshipped. Mary is merely to be respected. An early Christian father made the position very clear, saying, let Mary be honoured, but let the Son be adored. But here at least, whatever the male priests may think about it, this rule has little hope of being observed. Inside this Spanish church, a precious statue of the Virgin is ceremonially carried aloft and shown to the emotional crowd. The devout worshippers try to pass articles of their clothing or even their young children up to the priests to be touched onto the statue and given the Virgin's blessing. Similar scenes to this were no doubt witnessed on the sacred days of the early mother goddesses, such as Diana of Ephesus, but those have long since been forgotten. The Virgin Mary has successfully overshadowed all her predecessors. This adoration of the Virgin Mary was frowned upon by some religious authorities. They correctly saw it as a perpetuation of the worship of the ancient mother goddess figure. What they wanted in increasingly male-dominated religions was a shift to a central male figure. The official ruling was that Mary was to play only a supporting role to her son Jesus. In this, the religious leaders were largely successful. The early female deity had commanded great reverence because reproduction was revered. In those far-off days, it was vitally important for the domestic animals, the crops, and the human beings themselves to breed as freely and successfully as possible. Their survival depended upon it. But so successful was she that she brought about her own downfall. As villages grew into towns and towns into ancient cities, two things happened. One was that people started to become crowded together, so producing children became less of a burning need. And at the same time, the male role in organising these new cities became more important. The old male hunting groups became converted into new male ruling groups. They focused on a new kind of hunting now, the ritual hunting we usually refer to as war. War is usually described as human aggression, but in reality, it's more like stylized hunting. It bears little relation to true animal aggression. 
These young men don't know their enemies. They don't kill them because of personal hatreds. They kill them impersonally, like picking off distant prey, more to support their buddies than anything else. At the level of the common soldier, war is little more than an exploitation of the primeval hunting pattern of the human male by leaders with private agendas of their own. In some countries, men go shopping for guns at the local gun market, rather as women go shopping for vegetables. Guns have had an abiding fascination for men ever since they were invented 600 years ago. The Freudian interpretation of the gun as a metal phallus that ejaculates bullets has become something of a joke. And yet, the glee with which men play with their guns and the excitement generated when they fire them off does seem to go beyond the merely military. Are these men really thinking of the damage to human flesh that these weapons can cause as they lovingly inspect them and fondle them? Or are they acting out some deeper, more carnal, masculine fantasies? Although it's true that women have been known to engage in gunplay from time to time, the world of firearms has always been a predominantly male pursuit and has gradually become a standard expression of masculine power and the enforcement of male domination. Any attempt to take guns away from men who are used to carrying them produces a passionate reaction so intense that it's almost as if they're being threatened with castration. And it's undeniable that the development of male weapons from muskets to rockets has paralleled the rise of masculine domination in human society. As males rose to positions of power in the spreading civilizations, the ultimate shift had to occur. Even God had to change sex. The great mother goddess had to become God the Father, an all-powerful masculine figure more suited to the harsh new world of weapons, dungeons, tortures, battlefields, and other such manly inventions. After God had had the operation, a great deal was lost. Technology advanced, but at a huge price. The new, sterner, belligerent God figures brought with them a new relationship between the sexes. Women lost their high status. For a million tribal years, they'd been the equal of males. Different, but equal. But now they were relegated to a subordinate role. The gender wars had begun. In some cultures, even today, women are still treated as possessions of their husbands and must hide their faces from all other men. It's always been assumed that the wearing of the veil is Muslim in origin, but this isn't the case. It was originally introduced by the ancient Assyrians as a way of labelling high-status females. The custom was later taken over by male-dominated Muslim countries, despite the fact that in the Quran it states, and I quote, women shall with justice have rights similar to those exercised against them." Unquote. At a social level, somewhere along the line, those rights seem to have been lost. It's only in the privacy of their own homes that these women are allowed to remove their veils. 
and even here they must quickly put them on again if male visitors arrive. Arab countries vary in the degree to which they closet their women, and there are many different ways in which wives subordinate themselves to their husbands. For these adult females, life holds little in the way of adventure or creativity. Forbidden to show their faces in public, they must live out their existence in a social cocoon. This is a male world where, however one looks at it, it's clear that women have lost their social equality even though they're still expected to give birth to and rear the next male-dominated generation. The Jewish religion is just as male-dominated as that of the Muslims or Christians. Even in 20th century New York City, among strict Jewish communities, there are still strange rituals that involve the subjugation of women. One such ritual demands the complete covering and concealment of a married woman's hair. In preparation for marriage, the bride-to-be used to have her head shaved, but now her hair may simply be cut short. Then, in an amazing example of contradictory thinking, a special wig of hair is made to place over her natural hair and totally conceal it. In this cunning way, she can privately obey her strict religious laws, while at the same time publicly remain a fashionable New Yorker. Of course, the reason for the original shaving and concealment of the hair was to make the married woman less attractive to passing males. And the irony of this modern interpretation of the ancient tradition is that the wig is sometimes more beautiful than the original hair itself. In India, in earlier days, women were sometimes concealed in a different way. Instead of having to hide just their hair, they were shut away completely. This magnificent facade of the Palace of the Winds in Jaipur may appeal to us today as a brilliant piece of architecture, but when it was actively in use, it was a sad witness to yet another example of female subjugation. The reason it has so many windows, 953 to be precise, is because separate places had to be made available for each of the many wives and concubines who inhabited the palace, and who were not allowed out into the streets to enjoy the hustle and bustle and freedom of social life. Instead, they had to sit wistfully at their windows, watching the passing scene below without themselves being watched. One feature of the human female that has always been of great significance is her virginity. Now, there always has been and always will be a primeval sexual inequality between human males and human females, and that concerns certainty of parentage. Obviously, when a woman has a baby, she knows it's hers, but the man can't be absolutely certain whether or not he is the father. Now, over the centuries, there have been a number of attempts to reduce that uncertainty, and some of those have been pretty brutal. The most horrific of all is the operation called female circumcision. It may come as a surprise to you to learn that there are over 100 million women alive today who've suffered that particular form of mutilation. The operation is too horrible to show you, but it's important to understand its significance. The removal of the external genitals of little girls is done specifically to reduce their sexual pleasure in later life so that they'll be less likely to be unfaithful to their husbands. It's the ultimate abuse of women's rights, and although many authorities are strongly opposed to it, it still continues almost unabated in countries such as Nigeria, Ethiopia, Egypt, Sudan, Kenya and Somalia. The nagging fear that a wife might be unfaithful has driven men to bizarre lengths. They can veil her, keep her indoors, circumcise her, but none of these measures provides a final guarantee of total fidelity. Ultimately, the only certain way is to make the female physically impenetrable by fitting her with a device such as a metal chastity belt. 
500 years ago in Padua, in Italy, an eccentric tyrant forced his female partners to wear a metal contraption that he called a girdle of chastity. It consisted of a metal belt with a section that passed between the women's legs. Padlocked into position, it made it impossible for any man to have sexual access to them, even by force. Oh, wow. <laughs> And try on if they want to. What are these for? Over the centuries, the chastity belt became a source of many jokes and male fantasies. But contrary to popular opinion, it was never widely used. Today, beautifully crafted examples are still being made, but more for sexual amusement than for sexual control. Into this. So this now that should slip onto the third staple yep. there. That's fine. Yeah. And then if you'd like to go to the front <laughs> and just take that up. Forecast. Is that and comfortable? Yeah? Wow. Yes, it oh, be. Yeah. Push it down to her hips and slip it into the third. That's right. Ooh. There you go. Yeah. Yes, that's super. Well, that's a nice fit, fit, actually. That's not too tight. And then we can do the locks. I'm sure you'd like to do that, wouldn't you? Yeah, <laughs> that's so what you've been waiting for <laughs> to actually lock the lady up. <laughs> right. Give it up. Or you can push it against the brass, actually. Yeah. If you want to. That's it. Oh. And there's your side one. I won't get the keys mixed up for you. They have, uh, yeah, but there are two keys for each. That's it. Right. This is it then. Let's see how that fits. That's a very nice fit. Brilliant. Is that comfortable? It's really good. Are you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's smashing. So. Yeah. <laughs> there was one recent case of a chastity belt being put to serious use. A rape victim, traumatised by her experience, was only able to summon up courage to leave her house after well, she took to wearing one. Gradually, she regained her self-confidence and saved her marriage. So even this notorious implement of female subjugation was eventually turned into an aid to female freedom, at least for one woman. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Not all the devices of male domination are as blatant or as strange as the chastity belt. Sometimes they're so ordinary and familiar that they're taken for granted. Even in the liberated Western world, there are subtle ways in which the long shadow of female possession is still cast over our social occasions. Couples are still named as Mr and Mrs Smith, with the husband having taken possession, if not of his wife, then at least of her maiden name. In Estonia, following a wedding, the bride writes her maiden name on a piece of paper and places it in a bottle. Each of her wedding guests adds a small pebble to help make it sink, and the groom then seals the bottle and throws it as far as possible out into the sea. The bride makes a solemn promise not to swim or fish near the spot, and her maiden name is gone forever. <laughs> but it could be argued that the true symbolism here is that her name may be bottled up, but it's not destroyed. So there's always the thought that one day the bottle could break and her name would escape once more, or that it would be found by a diver or a fisherman. So perhaps the gesture is less final than it might appear at first sight. <laughs> the genteel atmosphere of the typical Western wedding appears to be balanced enough. But beneath the surface, there again lurks the shadow of the dominant male taking possession of his mate. For instance, the bride is given away by her father. She's passed on like a piece of property from the father to the groom for safekeeping. Nobody gives the groom away. The placing of a wedding ring on the third finger of the bride's left hand is also significant. The left hand is, by tradition, inferior to the right and the third finger is used because it has less independence of movement than the other digits. So the placing of the ring on that particular finger is meant to symbolize the inferiority of the bride and her loss of independent action. And before this congregation, I therefore proclaim that they are husband and wife. <laughs> After the wedding reception, when the couple are about to leave, they may find old shoes tied to the back of their getaway car. 
This harks back to the time when the bride's father would give one of his daughter's old shoes to the groom, who would tap her on the head with it, symbolising the fact that the father can no longer spank his daughter and that this is now the duty of the husband. The car speeds away and the couple set off to perform another ancient custom, the honeymoon. These thatched huts perched on stilts in a tropical lagoon are fantasy locations for many honeymooners. But I wonder if they realize when they're occupying these buildings what the origin of the term honeymoon is. Well, the moon part of it has to do with the moon's cycle, which takes four weeks. And it's the same time, of course, as the female menstrual cycle. Now, there's a special reason for that, because the idea in the old days was that you had to spend four full weeks on your honeymoon so that you'd be sure, if you were the husband, that you would be there alone with your new wife at the time when she was ovulating. This way, you made sure that if any child resulted from the honeymoon, it would be yours. In other words, it was a way of keeping away all the other males during that vital period immediately after the wedding ceremony. This, of course, was in earlier centuries. And also in earlier centuries was the explanation of why it was a honeymoon or honey month. That's because the young couple were told to drink honey in the form of mead, one of the oldest of all the alcoholic drinks, every day during those four weeks because honey increases your fertility. So the honeymoon really isn't just a matter of getting to know your bride, having a nice holiday. It's a matter from ancient times of ensuring paternity and fertility. Later, back at their new home, the groom may carry his bride over the threshold, reminding her yet again that she's a male possession. Wife carrying as an act of possession is also a feature of a strange competition that takes place each year in Finland. <laughs> Although this wife-carrying contest is a light-hearted affair, its origins are less amusing. Historically, it celebrates the capture and carrying off of females by men from neighbouring villages. In earlier centuries, marriage by capture was a common practice. And while it may have helped to avoid local inbreeding, it also had the effect of reducing the women involved to the status of mere objects. After countless years of subjugation, the 20th century saw the start of a major female revolt and the first serious challenge to masculine control. I first became aware of the feminist rebellion against male domination when I was returning from a trip to Japan via the United States. While I was in Japan, I saw that women did not like to have doors open for them uh, by a man. Indeed, my female interpreter, who considered me senior to her, refused to go through the door. Whenever I opened it for her, she said, no, 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 I won't go through. And I would say, please, go ahead because this was a polite thing for me as a European to do, but she refused over and over again. And I realized eventually that my politeness was causing her some embarrassment, so I gave it up. Then, on my way back, I went through New York, and there I went to a big department store, and I saw a woman arriving, and I thought, well, I'll be safe here. So I opened the door to let her go through, and indeed, she swept past me. But as she went past, she turned and hissed in my ear, pig. Of course, this was in the early 1970s. The female rebellion had first begun much earlier, of course, back in 1903, when the suffragettes set out to achieve political equality and gain votes for women. They met with enormous opposition, and as the years passed, their campaign became increasingly violent, with hunger strikes, window smashing, bomb attacks and arson. But it was the important role of women in the First World War that finally tipped the scales, and in 1919, 
the British Parliament at last admitted its first woman member. The political battle had been won. A second wave appeared in the late 1960s and early 70s with the feminist movement. A group of American activists formed the National Organization for Women and other groups were quick to follow, both in the United States and in Europe. The focus of attention now was not on votes, but on jobs. One of the leaders of the movement was Betty Friedan. Women are being laid off, and it's not funny. And I hear noises that say women shouldn't take jobs. The women should give up their jobs to male breadwinners. But that's not going to be the solution of this economic problem because female breadwinners are the only breadwinners for half of the women that are working. At its most passionate and extreme, the feminist movement became a hymn of hate for all things masculine. Women burned their bras and abandoned any articles of clothing that they felt pandered to male desires. What had given rise to this rebellion? First, the human population levels had risen so high that there was no longer any pressure for women to produce large families. Second, advancing technology had robbed the male of his age-old advantage based on superior physical strength. There were few high-status tasks that physically could not be performed by females. And third, the arrival of the birth control pill in the early 1960s had given women the possibility of the same kind of sexual freedom as men. For the first time in history, with no fear of unwanted pregnancy, women could play men at their own sexual games. For some women, however, the joy of the new freedom was to take an unusual direction. They gave up men altogether and turned to one another. At first sight, this motorcycle parade may look like a gathering of Hell's Angels, but on closer inspection, it turns out that all the riders, like most of the audience, are female. This group, known as the Dykes on Bikes, epitomizes a male-rejecting lesbian trend that's been growing in recent years. This branch of the feminist movement has not merely dispensed with male breadwinners, it's thrown them out of the bedroom as well. And it's even thrown them out of that traditionally male preserve, the striptease club. In this club, females dance strictly for other females. This is certainly not what Betty Friedan and the other more serious feminists had in mind when they were campaigning in the early days of the movement. Their goal was for economic equality. In fact, there are now two separate branches to the women's movement, one concerned with equality in economics and the other concerned with equality in eroticism. But then rebellions often create strange bedfellows. The majority of women seeking sexual equality have not, however, turned away from men. They've remained cheerfully heterosexual and expressed their new freedom by asking men to perform what, in the past, women have been expected to do. The lack of inhibition demonstrated by these women represents a major change of image for the modern female. Biologically, the human female has always had a powerful sexual potential. In the past, this has been culturally suppressed. Now, at last, it's joyfully released. Now the need to breed has been lessened and there are techniques readily available to avoid pregnancy, the females can once again enjoy a full equality with the males. But it's a new kind of equality. The old equality was based on the fact that heavy maternal duties didn't marginalize the females and cast them out to the fringes of society. Indeed, it was the males' hunting lives that marginalized them. The females, despite their maternal duties, remained in the very center of society. Today, 
the females have regained their central role, not by restructuring society, but simply by leaving the home and joining the males in the new workplace. This allows them to demonstrate their equality in intelligence, in ambition, and in energy. But it leaves them with one major disadvantage. The maternal urges deep inside many modern females are still strong. The nature of many work patterns clash with the need to produce even a single child. And for women, this is the principal problem that remains to be solved. These female traders on the stock market floor are clearly highly efficient at their jobs. But in joining the male rat race, they've inevitably lost some of their femininity. There's no place here for babies or children. It's an uncompromising, unfriendly atmosphere. I'm making a total of 15,000, right? Yeah. Because I just sold another thousand. But there's no going back now for the new woman. For her, the sky's the limit. In the new social climate that followed the female rebellion, many women decided to play men at their own game. On the principle that anything they can do, we can do better. Now, men, as part of the adaptation to a primeval hunting life, had evolved a strong inclination to take risks. So women would do the same. The female daredevil was born. Helen Tempest is a wing walker, and here in the west of England, she takes to the skies for a joyously symbolic expression of 20th century female freedom. The bird-like freedom of the wing walker may act as an exultant symbol of modern female rebellion, but for some women today, liberation wears a more violent expression. These female Japanese wrestlers are free to be as brutal as their male counterparts, with bruising results. Perhaps here we're seeing the freedom of females to behave as crazily as males.
6,000 miles away, a more serious challenge is being played out against a much more somber backdrop. Female firefighters are now often dropped by parachute into the very centers of California's all too frequent bushfires. Wing walking and wrestling is risk taking for its own sake. This is risk taking for the sake of the environment and for people's lives. The last bastions of male supremacy are beginning to fall but it still takes an exceptional woman to reach a senior position in the military. Old prejudices remain lurking beneath the surface. Although it shouldn't be necessary, in the armed services, women have to try that bit harder to gain the same positions as men. There have always been exceptional women, women who rose to positions of fame and power. None more extraordinary than Queen Hatshepsut, who ruled Egypt about three and a half thousand years ago. She was the only female pharaoh, and as there was no formal name for a queen in ancient Egypt, she called herself king. And to emphasize her status, she dressed as a man and on special occasions wore a ceremonial false beard. Powerful women like Hatshepsut have appeared from time to time, but throughout history, they've always been the rare exceptions. Today, it's much easier for a woman to rise to a position of social importance. So women today, at least in the West, have managed to rebel successfully against the old tyranny. Or have they? The truth is that although they've made a lot of progress, there's still a long way to go before they can regain the equality of the sexes that existed back in prehistoric times. Outside the great cities of the West, they're still looked upon very much as possessions and inferior beings in many, many cultures. And even in the West itself, there's still the problem of battered and abused wives to be solved. Despite all the advances that have been made, for a woman to gain a role of social dominance still requires a truly exceptional personality. Of course, for many women, dominance is more than they want. What they seek is a return to a genuine, unforced equality. One they can expect as a matter of course, instead of having to fight every inch of the way for it. The kind of equality that this pair of rock climbers symbolizes. Here on the rock face, the strength of the male is matched by the dexterity of the female, making them truly equal partners. Perhaps one day, all male-female relationships will be as perfect as this. In the meantime, males and females can, in theory, work alongside one another in a balanced relationship based on talent rather than gender, with the battle of the sexes relegated finally to history. In practice, it may take a little while because, of course, old entrenched positions are difficult to shift. But the conditions are right for a new era of male and female cooperation. Accepting the sexual differences, but also accepting sexual equality. Different, but equal. On this basis, who knows? We may see the dawn of the most exciting chapter yet in the remarkable history of our extraordinary species. <laughs>